This is Space Time Series 23, Episode 66, coming up on Space Time. Exploring the mysteries at the edge of the solar system. A new mission to Venus that could finally determine the lifespan of the neutron. And ESA's mission to study Earth's hydrological cycle. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's IBEX spacecraft has confirmed that the Sun's heliosphere is shaped like a giant comet. The heliosphere is a vast bubble generated by the Sun's magnetic field and solar wind, which envelops the entire solar system, all the planets and Kuiper Belt objects included. Data from NASA's Voyager 1, first spacecraft to reach interstellar space, showed the heliosphere extended out some 121 times further than Earth's orbit around the Sun, at least in the direction and at the time when the probe crossed the boundary. The borders of this cosmic bubble aren't fixed, but rather expand and contract in response to the constant stream of charged particles flowing from the sun known as the solar wind. The solar wind rushes out in all directions at some 1.6 million kilometers per hour until it collides with the competing pressure of the interstellar medium of gas and dust between the stars, which also includes the stellar winds being generated by other stars. Now, for the first time, scientists have been able to use the entire solar cycle of data from the Sun's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX spacecraft, to study how the heliosphere changes over time in response to the Sun's solar cycle. The solar cycle, that's the period from one solar minimum through to solar maximum and then onto the next solar minimum, lasts approximately 11 years. It's marked by the reversal of the Sun's magnetic polarity an event happening right now as the Sun's moving from solar cycle 24 into solar cycle 25. These solar cycles are characterized by increases in sunspot activity and corresponding increases in geomagnetic storms, the eruption of solar flares and powerful coronal mass ejections, which all peak at around solar maximum. And with IBEX's now long record, scientists were eager to examine how the Sun's mood swings play out at the edge of the heliosphere. The results reported in the Astrophysical Journal Supplements show the shifting outer heliosphere in great detail. IBEX has been observing this boundary to interstellar space for more than 11 years now, showing where our cosmic neighbourhood fits in with the rest of the galaxy. IBEX principal investigator David McComas from Princeton University says the mission has been hugely successful, lasting much longer than anyone anticipated, and having now provided an entire solar cycle of observations. As the Sun orbits around the center of our galaxy, it travels through the interstellar medium in the process, generating a hot, dense wave, much like the bow wave at the front of a boat cruising through the ocean. And the solar wind and the interstellar medium collide in a bow shock at the edge of the heliosphere called the heliopause. And just inside this lies a turbulent region known as the heliosheath. And particles called energetic neutral atoms, which are formed in this distant region of space, are the focus of IBEX's surveys. They're created when hot charged particles, like the ones in the solar wind, collide with cold neutral particles, like those flowing in from interstellar space. The solar wind particles start out as ionized, but they snatch electrons when they collide with the slower interstellar atoms, resulting in them becoming neutral. Now, the journey of these particles begins long, long before IBEX detects them. In fact, it takes about a year for the solar wind particles to travel from the Sun, past all the planets and the Kuiper belt, out to the very edge of the heliosphere. And along the way, the solar wind picks up ionized atoms from interstellar gases that have wiggled into the heliosphere, so that when the solar wind arrives at the edge, it's not the same solar wind that left the sun a year earlier. The solar wind particles then spend another six months or so bubbling away in the turbulence of the heliosheath. Now, inevitably, some of these will collide with the interstellar gases, becoming energetic neutral particles. It then takes these neutral particles another year for the return trip, traversing space from the edge of the heliosphere to reach Ibex. That's if the particles happen to be heading in just the right direction. Of all the neutral particles formed, only a few will actually make it to Ibex. The whole trip will take about two to three years for the highest energy particles in Ibex's observing range, and even longer for lower energies or ones from more distant regions. Ibex takes advantage of the fact that these neutral particles aren't diverted by the sun's magnetic field, the fresh neutral particles bounding away from collisions in nearly straight lines. So, Ibex surveys the skies for these particles, noting their direction and energy. And the result is a map of the interstellar boundary. 
Using IBEX's 11-plus years of data, the Comus and colleagues were able to study changes in the boundary as they evolved over time. See, the solar wind is constant, but it's not steady. When the wind gusts, the heliosphere inflates like a balloon and neutral particles surge at the outer fringes. When the wind calms down again, the balloon collapses and the neutral particles dwindle. This ensuing seesaw of neutral particles consistently echoed two to three years after the changes in the wind, reflecting their journey to the edge of this balloon and back. The authors found that between 2009 and 2014, the solar wind blew fairly low and steady, a gentle breeze, and the heliosphere contracted. But then in 2014, NASA spacecraft orbiting Earth detected solar wind pressure increasing by about 50% and it remained high for several years. And two years later, the same billowing solar wind led to a flurry of neutral particles in the heliosheath. Another two years after that, they filled most of the nose of the heliosphere, eventually cresting over the heliosphere's north and south poles. Interestingly, these changes weren't symmetric. Each observed bump traced the quirks in the heliosphere's shape. Scientists were surprised at just how clearly they saw this tidal wave of solar wind pushing and stretching up the heliopause. Ibex still hasn't observed the effects of this cosmic punch from the heliotail. That's the back end of the heliosphere. And that's got to mean the tail's much further away from the sun than what the front is, because it's taking these particles much longer to reach the spacecraft. It seems the sun is situated close to the front of the heliopause, and as the sun hurtles through space, the heliotail trails much further behind, something a lot like the streaking tail of a comet. These findings are also bringing scientists a step closer to explaining the mysterious Ibex ribbon. The ribbon is a puzzling feature, one of Ibex's biggest discoveries. It's a vast diagonal strip of neutral particles painted across the front of the heliosphere. Astronomers are yet to determine exactly why this part of the boundary should be so different from the rest. Over time, Ibex has shown that what forms the ribbon is very different to what's forming the rest of the interstellar sky. It appears to be shaped by the direction of the interstellar magnetic field. The authors think it's produced by a secondary process, causing the journey of a certain group of energetic neutral particles to roughly double. After becoming energetic neutrals, rather than ricocheting back towards Ibex, this group of particles would streak in the opposite direction, across the heliopause and into interstellar space. And there, they're trapped by the local interstellar medium until some inevitably collide with passing charged particles, losing an electron once again, becoming charged and therefore tied to the surrounding magnetic field. After a few years, these charged particles might collide with other slower particles and steal their electrons, resulting in them once again re-entering the heliosphere. So, the charged particles forming the ribbon have journeyed some two years more than the rest of the neutral particles observed. And when it comes to the solar wind spike we talked about, the ribbon took another two years after the rest of the heliosphere to even start responding. Far exceeding its initial two-year mission, IBEX will soon be joined by another NASA probe, IMAP, short for Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, that's slated to be launched in 2024. And so the mission of discovery of this the most distant edge of our solar system continues. This is space time. Still to come, a new mission to Venus could finally determine the lifespan of the neutron and ESA's mission studying Earth's hydrological cycle. All that and much more still to come on space time. Neutrons aren't a model of resilience when it comes to living a single life. Strip one from an atom's nucleus and it quickly disintegrates down into an electron and proton. But scientists don't know exactly how quickly that happens. That's despite decades of trying to determine it. And that's problematic because knowing the lifetime of a neutron is key to understanding the formation of the elements after the Big Bang. Now, a report in the journal Physical Review Research has used data from NASA's Messenger spacecraft, which studied the planet Mercury, to show how the lifetime of a neutron could be measured from space. The study's lead author, Jack Wilson, from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, says the observations demonstrate the feasibility of a method which could one day resolve this anomaly. Since the 1990s, scientists have disagreed about exactly how long neutrons can last, mainly because the two methods used so far give precise results that don't line up. The bottle method stores neutrons and tracks how long they take to radioactively decay, which on average is around 14 minutes and 39 seconds. On the other hand, the beam technique fires a steady stream of neutrons and then tallies the number of protons created from radioactive decay. 
On average, this takes about 14 minutes and 48 seconds, some 9 seconds longer than the bottle method. Now, 9 seconds might not sound like much, but relative to the uncertainty in either method's measurements, almost 2 seconds, it's enormous. Although researchers are continuing to use both the bottle and B methods to try and resolve the discrepancy, they've spent some 30 years looking at alternative ways by measuring neutron lifetimes from space. You see, cosmic rays colliding with atoms on the planet's surface or atmosphere set loose neutrons that gradually wind their way to outer space against gravity. And the further a neutron travels from the planet's surface, the more time's elapsed and the more neutrons will have radioactively decayed. By comparing the number of neutrons at various altitudes, a spacecraft could estimate the neutron lifetime. And NASA's messenger spacecraft just happened to have the right instrument to measure that kind of data. See, MESSENGER carried a neutron spectrometer. It was designed to detect neutrons scattered off hydrogen atoms in water molecules, which were suspected and later confirmed to be frozen as water ice in permanent shadow at the base of deep craters at Mercury's poles. On its way to Mercury, MESSENGER also collected neutron data over cloud-strewn Venus. The spacecraft made observations over a large range of heights above Venus and Mercury. The low-energy neutrons emitted by Venus's atmosphere move at a few kilometres per second. At MESSENGER's altitude, a few hundred to a few thousand kilometres above the planet's surface, those neutrons would have travelled for a time similar to the estimated neutron lifetime. Wilson says it's sort of like a large bottle experiment, but instead of using walls and magnetic fields, Venus's gravity can find neutrons for times comparable with their lifetime. The authors used models to estimate the number of neutrons MESSENGER would detect above Venus for neutron lifetimes to be between 10 and 17 minutes. When the scientists compared the actual number of detected neutrons with the model lifetimes, they found 13 minutes provided the best match. The authors estimate that lifetime could be off by about 2 minutes due to statistical errors and other uncertainties, such as whether the number of neutrons changes during the day or at different latitudes. Yet within these uncertainties, their estimates for neutron lifetime still agrees with values for both bottle and B methods. Because the uncertainties in space-based measurements are unrelated to those in lab-based methods, the researchers contend this new technique provides a way to break the tie between the existing measurements. Now they know how, making measurements that are more precise will require a dedicated space mission, possibly to Venus, since its thick atmosphere and large mass effectively traps neutrons around the planet. So the authors are now looking at the best way to accomplish such a mission with the ultimate aim of developing a spacecraft instrument that can make a high-precision measurement of the neutron lifetime and perhaps finally settle this outstanding mystery. This is Space Time. Still to come, ESA's ongoing mission to study Earth's hydrological cycle and China completes its Bidao military satellite navigation system. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The European Space Agency Soil, Moisture and Ocean Salinity, or SMOS spacecraft, has now been in orbit for more than a decade, studying Earth's water cycle and climate. The 658-kilogram satellite was launched on a Russian Rokot rocket, a modified Soviet Union-era SS-19 Stiletto intercontinental ballistic missile from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome, 800 kilometres north of Moscow. SMOS was placed into a 766-kilometre high orbit on what was meant to be a three-year mission. It's not only exceeded its planned lifespan, but has also surpassed its original scientific goals. See, it was built to demonstrate new technologies to study the hydrological cycle, soil moisture content, and ocean surface salinity. But SMOS is also being used to improve hurricane forecasting by collecting hurricane surface-level wind speed data using its microwave imaging radiometer, which has the ability to penetrate the thick clouds surrounding a cyclone. This report from ESA TV. As we head into summer, it's clear that many parts of Europe have had an unusually warm, dry spring. The lack of rain in certain regions is even visible from space. One of the satellites collecting data on this phenomenon is ESA's Earth Explorer mission, SMOS. For over a decade now, SMOS has been advancing our understanding of the Earth's water cycle and with its ability to measure surface soil moisture, SMOS acts as a rain gauge with global reach. In the past, SMOS data were primarily used for scientific purposes, but this has changed. Since more than 10 years now, SMOS provides us systematically with maps of global soil moisture and ocean salinity. It is the longest data record coming from a sensor specifically built for this purpose. 
This data is used in research, for example, to understand feedback mechanisms between the land and the atmosphere. Today, we also see an increasing uptake of SMOS products by operational services and more recently, even commercial operators. One of these commercial operators is the Dutch company Vandersat. They focus on commercial Earth observation services and use data provided by SMOS and other Earth observing satellites to create and develop data products. This includes maps that show the effects of drought throughout Europe. And thanks to the data being delivered in near real time, they can be used almost immediately for practical applications. We see those droughts uh, back in the maps we produce on a daily basis, uh, near real time. And we do that for several uh, customers. So the water authorities are using um, these drought situation maps basically to adjust their policy locally. Uh, the fire brigade and other safety services are using those maps to make a better estimate on the risk for a, a certain wildfire. And when there is a certain wildfire, those maps are used actually to calculate what the prediction will be in which direction will be the spread. Another opportunity that's now opening up is actually drought insurance. So with one of our uh, key partners, uh, Swiss Re, um, a reinsurer from Zurich, Switzerland, we are now investigating um, uh, to roll out drought insurance for farmers here in the Netherlands. Which means if their crops or their yield is lower than expected due to the drought, they will receive a payout. And this index, this drought index that defines this payout, that's fully satellite based and provided by us. Severe droughts are considered the number one threat to farmers, endangering crop yield and business. While 2020 is well on its way to being the hottest year on record, we can see how climate change is exacerbating drought across the globe. In parts of Western Europe, such as Belgium and the Netherlands, which are usually considered to be rather wet, Droughts are expected for the third year in a row. Conditions such as this could prove destructive for nature and agriculture in Europe and in other parts of the world. Here, satellite-based insurance will be key in helping farmers and governments manage the financial implications of drought. So if you look back, um, the, the number of farmers that insures for drought is increasing, but still it's not more globally, it's definitely less than 10%. In the European Union, maybe 20, 25% of farmers have insurance for drought. Um, with increasing droughts uh, to be expected in, in the coming decades, it, it would be really good to insure much more farmers and to really bring that number up to, to 40, 50 or even 70 percent of farmers in the world that have such insurance. And then at least we at Swiss we see no other way than to work with satellite products. As the risk of drought is expected to increase over the coming years, this type of satellite based drought insurance can help farmers mitigate associated financial losses. In these times of recurring drought, Earth observation satellites can benefit us in two ways. Firstly, they provide insight into the underlying processes of drought, which can help us to take steps to become more resilient in the future. Secondly, as satellites tell us precisely when and where droughts happen and who they affect, governments and aid organisations can use this information to help those who are most affected. From space, satellites like SMOS and Europe's Copernicus Sentinels can help us to better manage drought conditions and to better understand our planet's changing climate. And that report from ECTV featured SMOS mission manager Klaus Schiphol from the European Space Agency, as well as Thies van Leeuwen from Vandersat and Marcel Androfis from Swiss Agriculture. This is Space Time. Still to come, China completes its Spidao satellite navigation system and record-breaking heatwave conditions cooking the usually frozen wastes of Siberia. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has launched the final satellite in its Bidao military navigation system. The spacecraft was launched aboard a Long March 3 rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. 
The completed Bedau 3 navigation system now consists of 27 satellites in medium Earth orbits, five in geostationary orbit, three in inclined geosynchronous orbits, with another 20 earlier generation satellites as orbiting spares. Bedau provides Beijing's military with its own satellite navigation system for timing and targeting, independent of the Russian GLONASS, European Galileo and American GPS networks. As well as serving China's military, civilian signals are also available for third world countries taking part in China's sprawling Belt and Road Finance Initiative. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study shows that over the past five years, summer sea ice in the Weddell Sea area of Antarctica has decreased by more than a million square kilometres. That's an area the size of the states of New South Wales and Victoria combined. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, looked at satellite records of sea ice and weather analyses starting in the late 1970s in order to understand why summer sea ice in the Weddell Sea of Antarctica has reduced by more than a third over the last five years. They found the ice loss occurred due to a series of severe storms in the Antarctic in 2016 and 2017, along with the reappearance of an area of open water in the middle of the ice pack, which hasn't occurred since the mid-1970s. Because of the large year-to-year variability of Antarctic sea ice, the authors say they can't be sure if this is the start of the expected long-term decline of sea ice due to global warming, or if it will recover. I guess only time will tell. Meanwhile, in another sign of worsening global warming, record-breaking heatwave conditions are cooking the usually frozen wastes of Siberia. The European Space Agency's Copernicus Climate Change Service and the Danish Meteorological Institute are reporting that Russian towns above the Arctic Circle are experiencing temperatures of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. That's well above their usual zero-degree daytime temperature for this time of year, and some 13 degrees above the previous record. Scientists say the whole of winter and spring has repeated periods of higher-than-average surface air temperatures. They say average winter temperatures across Siberia were around 6 degrees Celsius above the long-term average, and that's higher than any year since records first began 130 years ago. The heatwave conditions are also believed responsible for wildfires in the area, a huge oil spill due to cracking pipes because of melting permafrost, and a plague of tree-eating silk moth larvae. The scientists say these alarming conditions are all symptomatic of human-caused climate change. Well, we all know North America has Tyrannosaurus rex, South America has Giganotosaurus, and Africa has Spinosaurus. Now, finally, there's evidence that shows Australia also had its own big predatory dinosaurs. Paleontologists from the University of Queensland analysed dinosaur footprints dating to the late Jurassic between 165 and 151 million years ago. The tracks were made by dinosaurs walking through the swamp forest that made up much of what is now southern Queensland. Most of the tracks used in the study belong to theropods, that's the same group of carnivorous dinosaurs that include Australovenador and Velociraptor. The tracks ranged from 50 to 80 centimetres in length, suggesting animals that were around 3 metres high at the hips and probably around 10 metres long. Now that's not much smaller than a 7-ton T-Rex, which stood around 3 and a quarter metres high at the hips and were around 13 metres in length, but didn't appear until at least 90 million years after the Queensland Giants. Scientists say these were probably some of the largest predatory dinosaurs on the planet at the time. The tracks were made by giant carnosaurs similar to Allosaurus. They were first discovered way back in the 1950s and 60s on the ceilings of underground coal mines at Rosewood near Ipswich and at Oakey, just north of Toowoomba. We've all seen those sci-fi films where astronauts are placed in stasis for long-distance spaceflight. Well, a new study reported in the journal Nature claims suspended animation may be a step closer after scientists identified brain changes that trigger a naturally occurring temporary hibernation state in some animals called torpor. The researchers were then able to introduce the same state in animals that don't naturally hibernate. Scientists achieved this by identifying a population of brain cells that control torpor and show that stimulating these cells induces it while blocking them prevents it. 
The authors say it may be possible to induce synthetic hibernation in humans if people have the same set of brain cells, which could be useful in reducing tissue damage or preserving organs for transplantation. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 